In the river there, you see there's a rhino carcass on your 12 o'clock. It's like a big rhino bull, so the horns would have been very big. The way we're carrying on, they're going to no longer be around. My grandchildren won't see the rhino. It's the extinction of an animal, and these people don't think about it like that. They think about it's quick money. We won't stop until we win this war. The war on rhino poachers just got tougher. Those fighting to save the animal now have hunting dogs. It's 8105, the guy who's underground following the tracks. They can call in air power when they spot a poacher's spore or footprint. And the newly formed rapid response unit is tracking the poachers 24-7. You can see where that aircraft is now landing. Uh, they're putting up uh, stopper groups, deployments. We were given exclusive access to the anti-poaching teams in the Kruger, South Africa's largest national park. It's a, it's a massive area of land. It's up to us to police it. Sometimes it's a daunting task. Um, and yes, you do get despondent, especially if you come upon car carcasses uh, on a daily basis. But we won't stop. I mean, we'll carry on until we win this war. They have two new helicopters, which means they've doubled their air power but they're trying to protect rhinos in an area the size of Israel. This is a site that may disappear in the years to come because the way we're carrying on, they're going to no longer be around. And that's what motivates these people to go out day and night, 24 hours a day, to try to protect them. The vultures are the first to alert us to another slaughter. There's no sentiment in the African bush. The latest dead rhino is a feast for parasites. This is now a crime scene, and the investigators go to work finding clues. They're searching for the bullet used to kill the rhino. The frequency that it's happening at, and it's just not stopping. It's the extinction of an animal, and these people don't think about it like that. They think about it's quick money. They don't think about it in the long haul, that this animal's going to be extinct. There's not going to be any more of them. And normally with heavy caliber, ammunition you will find the bullet just below the skin on this side but there's nothing so I need to take the skin off check for damage uh, or trauma below the skin broken ribs if nothing then we'll have to dig deeper it's evidence and uh, it can be used in court so it's, it's good if, if we find something um, we must send this uh, back, it's a bullet uh, evidence back. We send it to um, forensics in Pretoria. It's not nice. Um, I don't want to tell my grandchildren that they were rhinos. I want to show them to them. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's disturbing. There are worse sites waiting for the anti-poaching unit. Like this one, the rhino still alive days after his horn has been hacked off, just clinging to life. Or this creature, the poachers failed to get his horn, but slashed at his hind legs before he escaped. He had to be killed anyway to put him out of his pain. So the hunting for the hunters has gone up a notch. This, sadly, is just a training exercise. The arrests have gone up, but so has the poaching in the Kruger by nearly 30%. They have more dog units, more boots on the ground. And they're developing and honing skills aimed at striking fear into the soul of any poacher. Then we, working with the dog, it helped us a lot. Attacking one man, it's like attacking a one man with three guys when I'm with my dog. So it helps a lot. But there's simply not enough of them. It's a 24-7 job. Um, any time of day, night, you've got to run in it and uh, you've got to react to shots or to poachers' visual or to tracks. And um, it takes its toll on, on, on a family because you don't always see them. 
um, and the stress, the stress level can be quite high. 24 hours after we're with investigators at one rhino carcass, rangers have radioed in and fly a white flag to signal they've spotted another. In the river there, you see there's a rhino carcass on your 12 o'clock. It's like a big rhino bull, so the horns would have been very big. They can shoot right along the fence here next to the river, or they can go 10, 12 kilometers into the park as well. They have their tactics as well. And if you look at just at just other side this uh, this train, you'll see a person with cattle standing under the tree now. I don't know if you can see him there. Now well, that could be a scout. I'm not saying it is, but it could be. So he could be walking up and down the fence with his cattle. And if he sees a rhino, he'll pick up his phone and call the poacher. And that poacher will come and then shoot the rhino. It's a very big community. Lots of people. And you can see it's, it, there's a lot of poverty, so they are recruited by people who are running these syndicates, you know, and they can't, uh, they, the money's so big that they take the chances. We join the rangers who've spotted the fresh carcass on the ground. The poachers operate in armed groups, usually in threes, and they're well equipped. They're using the binoculars, they're listening, I check the, 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 the rhinos. And I watch the, they're looking at the, um, the field ranger. Where is the field ranger? Before they're shooting. So we must keep quiet always, all the time, when we're walking. In the park at the moment, there are something like 15 poaching groups operating. They know that. And all the time, every time they don't find one, there's a possibility of another animal being slaughtered. So we might find a, a rhino track. It's got a bit of blood on it. Then we know, let's follow it. Has it been shot and wounded? Or has it been gored by another animal? So these are the kind of things you've got to follow up day in and day out. And with heat like this, I think we're sitting at 41 degrees. It's not easy on the guys. The crisis has led to some tough decisions. It's just under anaesthetic now, so there's, it's a normal rhino anesthesia. That's why we give it the oxygen as well. Um, no, no major issues at all. They're moving part of their rhino family out of the national park altogether. Sorry, These are the lengths they're having to go to to save the rhino, all because of its horn, because someone wants to pay the price for what is effectively the same as a fingernail, just made out of keratin. But because of that, they're now taking extreme lengths to save the creature. It's been bought by a private buyer, tranquilized, and now going to be taken to safety on a private safari farm. The rhino's partially revived. It weighs about one and a half tons. So it has to be able to walk itself, sleepily and blindfolded to lessen the trauma, into the crate which will take it to its new home. Those killed leave behind young, which often also need to be rescued. Their relative light weight means they can be airlifted. Baby rhinos like Winter, left orphaned by poachers, are especially vulnerable in the wild. His ears were savaged by hyenas. Another rhino named Manji by his saviors had his eye slashed by poachers with the same machete they used to kill his mother. Guy. Both animals were brought here. We're not saying exactly where in South Africa for their protection. Hey, yeah, Mr. Bokis. Okay, what are that side? One animal down. Okay, another one. <laughs> so there's about a hundred kilograms between these two. Um, this one is three months, four and a half, five and a half. Winter's now fully recovered, entirely unbothered by his lack of ears. And Manji, squashed in the middle of two other orphans here, 
has barely a scar left from his deep cut. Although his sight is badly affected and he'll need future operations. The squealing you hear is them asking for more milk. They, like all the orphans brought here, are cared for day and night by an army of volunteers who nurse them back to health and whose contributions fund the centre set up by Petronel Nivot. Manji was about two weeks old when they killed his mom and attacked him, axed him with a machete. And um, they didn't do well at all, Alex. Yo, we struggled with him because of the blood loss and the trauma. And the eye, the injury on the eye, um, was really a big, big, big problem. Because remember, the skin on the head keeps on opening. You know, it's stretching. And we were very afraid that he would lose his eye. Interesting enough, that eye is fine. But his other eye, that eye got a puncture wound on the cornea. And, uh, and it looks like that will be with him his whole life. Hey. They couldn't do it without the volunteers. They really couldn't because obviously you see so many rhinos. And now all the rhinos that are orphaned that come to, through Kruger, um, so that's every rhino, obviously most of them come from Kruger Park because that's the biggest sort of reserve round. And if we didn't have them, then that really is the future, I think, of all the rhinos then, because that's just the majority of everything. We look after them in every aspect. We're up at two o'clock, you know, doing night feeds, so we have to be there. We're working. I really, really don't want to see the rhinos being extinct. I think they're you know, an incredible part of Africa and I just, I love them so much and I think it'd be such a shame to see them lost. <laughs> see, but this behaviour is good behaviour. Look, they're running and playing and showing off and I love it. In a very short time under constant care, there's a world of difference in the calves. Standing is man. Huh? I love it. They've got back their spirit. No longer are they traumatised. Before we know it, we will be out of rhinos. So every single rhino there is, we need to try and save. But we're still a long, long way from achieving that. Alex Crawford, Sky News, South Africa.